Uh, I'll be talking about an, uh, an, an invention that we did in the lab of Hans Klevers a few years ago, which allows us to grow stem cells uh, and the di and differentiated cells of these stem cells of many different organs uh, of people. And also in case of, for instance, cancer uh, of the diseased cells, which basically uh, means that we have what we call organoids, diseased tissue in a dish, uh, that is patient specific and we can grow from virtually every patient. Um, so basically the, 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 the method started off with the stem cell biology, the identification of the stem cell and the process of identification of how this stem cell actually expands. Um, and then with that we started building a biobank, uh, we call it a living biobank which basically is uh, material that is either biopsies from cancer patients or resections. We take a very little bit of that, put it in our dish with the method of growing it, and that basically expands this uh, diseased or healthy cells of these different organs, intestine, kidney, lung, etc., uh, into a biobank, into an indefinite amount of material for science or drug development. Basically, the LGO5 marker was the starting point of the organoid. Um, in the lab of Hans Klevers in the uh, sort of early 21st century, they were looking for markers of stem cells. We knew about embryonal stem cells, we knew about hemopoietic stem cells, but for adult stem cells, for solid organs, we had an idea that they were there and how they worked, but we had no idea which ones they were. So we were looking for a marker flag on these cells. LGO5 turned out to be a molecule that was specifically expressed on intestinal stem cells, and later on we found that it was also true for liver and pancreas and various other organs, but basically it allowed us to identify this is a stem cell, an adult stem cell in the intestine, and this is not. So what, what we found is that first of all, uh, as we know from uh, cancer research over the years, is that in cell lines, when we grow them, they undergo multiple changes in order to allow them to grow in the lab, in a lab, in a dish. Um, so basically what we're growing is not, uh, not necessarily representative of the cancer that we're studying. Furthermore, it's very difficult to establish the cell lines. So we have only a few thousand cell lines uh, available to us on all the different diseases that we are studying. Um, with the organoids, we have on the one hand a system that allows us to expand unlimited cells of uh, cancer or other diseases, but they are genetically stable. As far as the disease goes, cancer in itself obviously be genetically unstable, but we basically preserve the identity it had when it came out of the, of the body. Uh, also very important, that doesn't work one in a thousand or one in a hundred, it actually works for almost every patient. So on the one hand, you have a stable growth in your dish, so you have a, 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 something that looks like the patient, and on the other hand, you can actually do that for every patient that you want to look at. So the change is basically that before when you study something in a dish, it is a resemblance maybe of the patient, whereas on the, and now we have actually the patient in the dish. So initially, of course, when we develop something new, it is more expensive. In the case for organoids, the reagents are more expensive than what we're used to uh, for cell lines. On the other hand, by now, we have uh, obviously gotten better at it. We grow the reagent better. Uh, that means that it's actually very comparable to a normal cell line. And especially when we compare to the more advanced models that we're currently using, including xenograft models in animals, etc., uh, the organoids, which are in the end just cells in a dish, are actually not so expensive at all. In uh, the organoid successes at the moment, most of them are actually in cystic fibrosis, the disease that we're most advanced at, where we have started treating the first patients based on an organoid result. So with the organoids, we were able to identify this disease that has over 2,000 different mutations. Of course, of most of them, we have no idea how they respond to drugs, and there are a very, very limited number of patients to study. Um, what we did there is we made organoids of these patients, and we have a specific assay to show if uh, these samples respond to drugs. And with that, we could identify some patients that were actually very good responders to certain new CF drugs. Um, and the interesting thing was that because there were unique mutations of really like one, two or three different individuals in the world, those were patients that were otherwise not eligible for treatment because obviously there's no clinical trial for two patients. 
So with that, we basically have started treating patients uh, and, and, and indeed that show a very good response. Um, with cancer, we just started our trials to do the same thing, which we call a, a clinical validation trial, basically to see if what happens with our organoids when we treat them in our dish and what happens to the patient in parallel and to see if that indeed is predictive. At the moment, we have started our inclusion. We have about 20, 30 patients in it. So we have to probably next year, I think about a year will take for us to definitively show whether the organoids for cancer are also indeed predictive in the clinical outcome. On the other hand, though, um, in the preclinical side of things, uh, the organoids are obviously a new model. Uh, most of the models in uh, breast cancer, for instance, hormone sensitive tumors, uh, in, in pancreas cancer, where we had very few models. Uh, so the organoids have already added an enormous amount of new model systems uh, to, for us to use to do drug development. Uh, that was our first sort of implementation before we started thinking is it also valid in the clinic itself. Mm -hmm.